Thompson, thank you so much uh, for coming to Office Hours. Uh, this is our first Office Hours of 2023. Uh, this is a place where I talk to uh, readers and watchers and listeners and friends of the Atlantic about abundance and economics and um, the future of progress. And today I'm very, very excited to tell you that we have my friend, uh, the Bloomberg Opinion columnist, Connor Sen, to answer all of your questions about and all of my questions about the 2023 economy. Before we get started, a quick thanks to our underwriter, Lexis, for supporting Atlantic's journalism today and many other days. Uh, let's jump right in. Connor, hello. Great to see you. Derek, nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, let's start with today's GDP report. Um, it uh, came in pretty hot for an economy that is theoretically in a recession, according to some people on CNBC. <laughs> Just give me your general impressions. What did you think of the GDP report? So to me, the exciting thing is we ended the, the 2022 with two straight quarters of economic growth, around 3%. And then it also looks like in January, things are starting out better than expected, even a few weeks ago. So we can take the momentum we had in the second half of last year, apply it in the beginning of this year. And to the extent people are worried about a recession, that concern should be pushed farther and farther into the future. Into the future. One thing that people are saying, some of the naysayers are saying, well, you look at the components of GDP, you've got consumer spending, you've got government spending, you've got inventories, you've got exports and imports, and the baton has somewhat been handed off between GDP reports. Like some GDP reports, it looks like it's one thing that's driving the economy, and then in others, it looks like another thing that's driving the economy. Um, and some people are paying attention to what I guess I could come to call like super core GDP, the same way that right with inflation, we say, all right, don't look at food, don't look at energy, that stuff, those global commodities, they go up and down. They're not really predictive of the future of inflation. Look at the core stuff. And they say, if you look at the core stuff, if you just look at consumer spending, it kind of seems like it's slowing down and that should maybe get us to worry about the future of the economy. How do you respond to these fears of the uh, this slowdown? And let's just call it, I've totally made this up, but let's just call it for now, super core GDP. Sure. So to be fair, yeah, about half of the 3% the gain we saw was due to inventories being rebuilt. And to some extent, those inventories might be overbuilt. So it's fair to point that out. But on the other, if you look at sort of some of the other things that were lagging in Q4, residential investments, so housing detracted almost a percent and a half. And that appears to be getting better in Q1. So we should expect that to improve. Also, automobile production remains weak, but that seems to be getting better in 2023. So we should expect that to pick up as well. And then to the extent the financial conditions seem to be loosening as the stock market goes up a bit, we can maybe get some other boosts there. So I think there are some puts and takes, but you know, maybe Q4 is a little softer on the super core side, but that just means we should expect Q1 to be a bit better in that regard. 
Right. So I'm thinking about the best argument why we're going to have a recession in 2023 and the best argument why we won't have a recession in 2023. And why don't I throw both of these at you and then you can sort of play with them. I think mm -hmm. the best argument for why we're going to have a recession this year goes something like the following. Um, this is mostly a story about consumer spending. Consumer spending powered us through 2022, even though we had kind of a recession in housing and a slowdown in some other parts of the economy that were extremely rate sensitive. But you look at retail sales, those have been weak for several months. We are likely going to have housing itself is in a bit of a recession. We're likely going to have more rate increases by the Federal Reserve as it takes more of those increases to really push inflation under 4%, 3%. And with all of that, it's just really likely that we're going to go slow, slow, slow into an actual technical recession. That's the reason, I think that's, that's the best case for why we're going to have this recession. And it is in many cases predicated on a Federal Reserve story. You are a, have been, I guess, for the last year, a huge defender of, and I think very articulate defender of, the case that these recession fears are actually overblown. This is not the 1970s. It's a totally unique economy. And when you add everything together and you look at the fact that inflation really does seem to be coming down in many different cases, we should maybe be more optimistic about the fact the Fed will pull off and consumer spending will be enough to carry us through positive growth for the rest of the year. Number one, have I done a bad job of summarizing your case for why we are not going to have a recession? And then how do you really push back against those who say, and many you know, people, bank analysts, economists are very clear in the fact we are going to have a recession. How do you most push back against that argument? Yeah, I think the big fear that markets have had really since June was that inflation was going to be too hot. And because of that, the Fed would keep going and going and going until we have to have a recession. And as we've seen over the past few months, inflation seems to be finally cooperating. And I think we're going to see that cooperation on kind of the good side, things like automobiles and furniture and apparel for at least the next quarter or two. We also see on the shelter side that rents are now coming down. And that's going to flow into the inflation data later in the year. So I think the inflation reports the government's been so focused on that looks so bad for the past year and a half, those should look better for at least the next several quarters. And then the Fed, to your point, they're likely to raise rates at the next week's meeting and then one in March. Markets think that's going to be it. And I think the inflation data supports that for a while. And so to the extent that market, what really matters is what markets have priced, not what the Fed is actually doing. They have priced this interest rate path for over, over two or three months now. And you can see the markets are now going up. So they've sort of digested the moves we're going to have. And they say, that's fine. We're doing fine. And in terms of the pushback to the recession calls, if you look at the real weakness last year, the things that were the weakest, you had sort of the retail sector in general, as people started shifting their spending to leisure and hospitality, things like dining and travel. And that has really been a drag on growth for nine months or so. And that appears to finally be turning the corner just this month. And then housing. And again, Housing seems to be doing, again, not great, but better than it was in the fourth quarter. So that should be less of a drag. And then even to the extent that tech layoffs, which are getting so much publicity in terms of, you know, how can we be having tens of thousands of tech layoffs and not being in a recession or going into recession, to the extent that was just over hiring during the pandemic, and then they're just kind of trimming the excess that they hired, that might be done. Because again, if the stock market starts going up, they say, okay, maybe the market thinks we've done enough. We can move past that. And then even you could say China reopening is good for the US economy, Europe getting better, not having the, the brutal winter on the energy side that they expected. So it's hard to point to anything specific and say, this is going to be the thing that, that makes it happen in 2023 beyond sort of nebulous Fed inflation concerns. I think of it kind of as the CNBC fallacy right now. When I see these CNBC links right now on Twitter and when I, when I, you know, I actually tune in from time to time, it seems like they're putting the tech layoffs and the GDP figures on equal footing, as if what's happening to 0.1% of the labor force is as important as what's happening to 99.9% .9 of the labor force. My perspective is these are not similar phenomena. It can be the case that we're having a bit of a flippening in the economy, that we're used to an economic narrative that says the economy is weak, but Silicon Valley is our little tiny engine that could, and it is powering us through. And right now, we're seeing a bit of a flipping of that narrative. In fact, the general economy, at least from a labor market standpoint, is much stronger, 3.5% unemployment, than Silicon Valley is strong. These are relative arguments. Like big tech is still huge, and big tech is going to continue to be huge for a decade, but they're going through this, this contraction that is the result of all these weird things that happened. They thought, for example, the pandemic was an accelerator. It turned out to be a bubble. They were dependent upon a low rate environment. Rates went up, et cetera, et cetera. They're having their own crisis. I want you to make me smarter about housing for a second. 
because I follow what I think are, are pretty smart people in housing, and they seem to be telling a story that says that housing really is going through its own kind of industrial recession. I mean, like industry-specific recession. You see construction pulling back, construction being a rate-sensitive sector. You see that housing prices are falling in many different metros. Why should we be optimistic about housing, this huge and really important part of the economy? Well, I think that people look at mortgage rates now, which were in the low sixes, and they say, this is still way too high. They were just 3% a year ago. How can the housing market possibly handle 6% mortgage rates? And this is maybe just the way markets work, but in November, mortgage rates were over 7%. And so in the past two months, you could say, hey, look, they're down a percent in the past two months. And as a result, we've seen like mortgage purchase applications tick up. We've seen from realtors and home builders saying that in January, that sort of buyers who basically went to the sidelines for all of 2022 have now come back and are at least kicking the tires and seeing what's going on. Home builders have responded to the, the, the high mortgage rates by doing these mortgage rate buy downs for a lot of prospective buyers where they might offer one, two, three years of reduced mortgage interest rates as a concession akin to cutting the price on, on a home. And that appears to be getting some traction. So, and then in the existing market, inventory isn't as high as people expected when mortgage rates surged. And the, even pricing there, outside of maybe a half dozen metros in the Western US, is okay. It's not great, probably still falling a little bit, but not the end of the world. So you just kick the tires and are things great? No. But are they as bad as people think? Probably not either. Where do you think the Fed is okay with inflation landing for the medium term? I think if they can get it into the twos and feel like there's a path back to two, they're okay with that. And so we probably need a few more months of evidence in terms of making sure that the sort of better prints we've gotten over the past few months aren't just a fluke. Because in 2021, even early 2022, you'd ever occasionally have a month or two of better data, and that turned out to be a head fake. So they need to make sure that's not what's going on here. But again, I think if we have inflation below three on like sort of a, a shorter term basis, a three or six month basis, and they feel like there's a path to two if growth slows over the medium term, they'd be okay with that. And that's why I think markets have priced the rate path that they have, because they think that's what we're going to get. Are you worried that there's a tension between two things that you said? On the one hand, that you're confident that we won't have a recession because the Fed will pull back on rate increases. But also, number two, that the Fed is expecting or hoping the headline inflation rate to head under 3% and stay under 3%, which, you know, to me, it, it, it might happen, but we also might be in for a situation where inflation instead like settles at like 3.6%. Like that's the real unknown for me. Like what if the Fed succeeds in getting inflation under four, but it turns out that inflation under three is a lot harder. Are they willing to risk a recession and like hundreds of thousands of layoffs just for getting long-term inflation or even medium-term inflation, just that one percentage point lower? Well, and I think that's the question that I have for later in the year. And again, we, we have things like used car prices are still coming down and furniture prices are still coming down. So we have all these things that were very, very elevated due to the pandemic and supply chain problems. Those, have, those are coming down. But at some point, used car prices aren't going to zero. So those are going to find a level, a post-pandemic new normal. And if we still have things like a tight labor market, wage increases, maybe a commodity boom due to things going on in the world, and those start ticking back up, then the inflation reports we've gotten over the past few months won't persist. And so... You know, it's sort of, again, I think we're going to go very, very low and then kind of bounce back like a V-shaped recovery for inflation, potentially. And it's hard to know how they're going to feel about that because we're still kind of on the way down. So it's hard to know, you know, we have to see how low we're going to go. But I think it's a very fair point. And people have been worried about it for the past six months, whereas to me, it's more of a story for later, much, much later in the year. Let's move on to from economics to sort of political economics. How concerned are you about the debt ceiling? I am not this time. And it's weird because the last time I was like a real freak about it. Um, I was, I had, you know, some people smoke pot when they were younger. I guess that's fine now, but when, when you're younger, not so much. And I was like, had my libertarian phase. And so I was like big into audit the Fed, all these like crank libertarian gold standard things. And so when Republicans won the House in 2010, I really thought they would pick this battle over the debt ceiling at a time when I think the DC media was still kind of in this George W. Bush establishment Republican phase, and it really kind of caught everybody by surprise. Whereas I think this time around, I mean, the fact that we're talking about this in January for a problem that really won't be an issue until at least June. And then it's also House Republicans don't really have any specific spending plans. Nobody wants to talk about what they, exactly they want to cut. Former President Trump says don't touch Social Security and Medicare. We know they want to, don't want to touch defense spending. It's like, well, what are y'all going to cut? Mm -hmm. So I, 
even though it's hard to see exactly how it's going to work out right now, I don't think when push comes to shove, there's going to be an issue here just because House Republicans don't seem to have an ask and certainly one that can get 218 votes within their conference. I am scheduling a possible freak out about this story in like two to three months. Fair. But I, have, I think like you, I have already freaked out about the debt ceiling so many times in the last, I've worked for the Atlantic for 14 years. I feel like, especially my first like seven years at the company, when I really was like a politics and macroeconomics writer, it was basically my job to have panic attacks about the debt ceiling <laughs> right. and to like sublimate those panic attacks by writing essays for the Atlantic. And after a certain number of times of like, you know, the boy crying wolf, you realize like, we're not going to default on our debt. Like, it's, it's too unthinkable. It's too fundamentally stupid. We're going to walk up to that threshold every single time, and we're going to find some way to get through it. And like, maybe it's possible that maybe, you know, a smart person could come in and say, Derek, it's precisely your confidence that we're not right. going to cross that line that makes it more likely that at some point we're going to cross that line. Like if, if you have your finger hovering over the nuclear weapon button for, you know, 70 straight years, eventually you're going to press down on it. But I, I just refuse to freak out about it until we are at the 11th hour. And well, maybe yeah, it's not it, a responsible position to take, but it's just the position that I now hold. And it's also, we know that the Biden administration does have unilateral tools to de disarm this thing, and they might not want to use them. They don't want to mint the coin. They don't want to issue there super high coupon or like any of these crank internet ideas that are legal. Um, but ultimately, if it's you know that or default, they would do something. And it's just... I'll worry about it in May, and but let's like watch the drama play out for three or four months to see where this goes first. Yeah, if people have further questions about the debt ceiling, please put them in the comments. I um, I almost am not interested in it yet because I feel like this is a movie that I've seen so many times that I'm not interested in telling you that I like how it's going that it's going to end any differently than it's always ended in the last 10, 15 years. Well, and I think I think right now the consensus is you know both Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer in the Senate have said the House has to come up with a plan, present this plan and prove they can get votes for it. And so that's the next phase. I think you and I are both very skeptical they'll be able to do this, but that's, let's watch to see how that goes and then we can worry about June in June. Yeah, uh, again, if you guys have further debt ceiling questions, just put them in the comments and we can spend some time in the second half of the, uh, in the Q&A section uh, addressing them. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about entertainment and media. Um, I'm so fascinated by what's happening in TV and film with Netflix and Disney. Um, the turnover in their executive staffs. And this really big story to me, which is that five years ago, certainly in, during the pandemic, just two, two and a half years ago, it was so obvious that streaming was the future of entertainment. And now when you look across the entertainment media landscape, there really is like not a single entertainment media company that is thriving, right? Like all of the stocks are down. All of the executives are trying to figure out what the next step is. And it seems to me like, Streaming was, I think I, I think I tweeted this yesterday, uh, but I'm not above just uh, uh, doing the, the pathetic thing on, a, on, on Zoom of trying to recreate my, my tweets. Um, it's almost like this was a conspiracy. Netflix like is a conspiracy that <laughs> persuaded the entertainment companies to burn all of their profits in order to subsidize TV and film development and viewership, thinking that this was the like a big profitable future and now realizing, wait, like there are almost no profits at all to be made on streaming. How do you see, how, what do you think is coming next in this story of streaming? Because right now, this is not working out for most companies. Disney, I think in its last quarter said it lost $1.5 billion on Disney Plus. That's not a business. That's a prayer. So, like, so what do you think happens next? I remember when Amazon first took off and I was thinking, I pay $80 a month for cable that has ads. And that's an okay business. And then Netflix is going to charge me $15 a month with no ads. And they're going to make money doing this. Mm -hmm. It didn't make a ton of sense to me then. And now it's like, we have a half dozen services or more that want to charge me $15 a month with maybe ads or limited ads. And somehow it's all going to work out. And so it, it sort of never really made sense in the macro. But it was like, once Netflix proved this is how people want to consume media, everybody else decided this is what they had to do. And I think now like the industry is so pot committed with the streaming model that this is what we're stuck with. And now it's just a question of how do we make money out of it or how do we take the losses out of it might be a better way of putting it. And so for 2023, I think they're all gonna figure out a way to cut spending because they have to, their investors will demand it. And we'll see what that does to user numbers. If they're not, you know, if, if they're not producing as, as much content, will people still subscribe? And at that point, it might just be like, you sort of see who on the plane has oxygen masks and is still breathing. 
And then if you're really struggling, it's like, okay, you get taken out, you go away, and we're left with whoever can survive this next two or three years. I wonder if one take is that the future of television is going to look more like the future of movies than we think, by which I mean this. Mm. So, you know, um, in the 1940s, Americans bought about 35 movie tickets a year. In the 2010s, they bought about four. Now they buy about, it seems like two and a half. And one thing that the movie studios did is accidentally or purposefully train movie audiences en masse to basically reserve their tickets, hold their tickets until they see a new iteration of a franchise that they recognize, right? So that's why movie ticket returns in the US, domestic box offices are like more unequal than ever. Overall box office is down because people aren't going to see original films as much as they used to. But if you look at the returns for Avatar or Top Gun Maverick, these are all time hits, not just in terms of their you know, non-inflation adjusted box office, but also in terms of the number of tickets that people um, are, are buying to see these films. And so it's like, okay, in movies, the general thing has been that as competition heats up, as there's more competition, the top performers recognize, unfortunately, that the, the best bet for blockbusters is to deliver new iterations on familiar franchises. And I wonder if one thing that you're going to see with, for example, Netflix or Disney Plus, or you know, even maybe Amazon Prime um, and HBO Max, is this recognition that, okay, in the next act of the streaming story, of the, of, the, of the digital entertainment story, in the next act, we need to start harvesting franchises even more than we used to. And so the cost um, savings that you were talking to, the cost savings you were alluding to, are going to be manifest in the fact that we're going to get fewer original stuff on these streaming networks and more like Stranger Thing universes um, and you know Game of Thrones style universes. <laughs> And that the exact, so fundamentally the same fun, this phenomenon that we're seeing or have seen in the last you know, 20 years in movies is going to essentially be the, uh, the future of TV. How do you generally feel about that take? Yeah, I think sort of money balling or data dulling to use the term that we've there been talking go. about yeah. for entertainment might be the way. I, the, the one that I'm kind of hopeful for, and it's just maybe because me as like a 90s kid wants my childhood back, is mm -hmm. Apple seems to really be leaning into like stars. It's like Reese Witherspoon on a show. And she, it's like the Reese Witherspoon universe rather than just like another Marvel thing. Or, you know, here's Tim, she, Timothy Sh uh, Chamelet on a, you know, an ad for them. So it's like, here's a star, you know, and here's a, an original script. Will you watch it? So I'm hopeful that has a chance too, because I just don't want to watch any more Marvel shows. I wonder whether, you know, there's this, there's this sort of meme or maybe it's a motif in sort of entertainment essaying about how we've, we passed the age of the movie stars. The age of mm. movie stars is over, Tom Cruise accepted, and the future mm. is franchises. And, you know, I don't know that I entirely buy that model, but um, Matt Bellany, who um, is a writer with Puck News and has a podcast with The Ringer called The Town, which is excellent, he did an analysis, or, or, or Puck paid for an analysis of um, the approval rating for various streaming uh, networks. I don't know if you saw mm. this, but really interesting. So basically they were like, of, peop of, of the general population, what streaming network has the highest approval? And then of users of those networks, what streaming network has the highest approval? No surprise, Netflix finished one and one in both surveys, both of the general population and of users. And Netflix, their penetration is so high that it's not surprising it would be the same. I was so surprised because I think that Apple does some really good shows, but the bottom of the list, like lower than like Peacock and all of those, huh. Paramount was Apple, even among its own users. And so, it just, it makes me wonder whether Apple's hits, so to speak, are such elite phenomena that mm. they aren't actually that meaningful to the general entertainment industry as a signal of what to do going forward. Because fundamentally, the age of the movie star, right, that, 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 that was probably at its apogee in the 1940s or something, that age is just over. People don't buy tickets for stars. They buy tickets to stories. And stories are IP and IP is really expensive and hard to develop and certainly harder than just like, are you free, The Rock? Are you free, you know, Kevin Hart? It's me. Never. Right. And so that just makes me wonder whether um, whether whether the star model is, is not as as powerful um, as it used to be. And, and we still are, are stuck with the IP story model. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you might be right. And it's, I find that pessimistic, but it's also, I'm over 40 now. So maybe it's sort of like, they're not making content for me as much as people in their teens and twenties and thirties. And if Marvel and Disney content is what they want, then that's what we're going to get until people get tired of it and something else emerges.
Yeah. Let's talk about a subject that I know you want to talk about, which is um, Georgia, uh, where you live. And sure. Georgia, especially as a hub for this new clean energy industrial policy that the Biden administration seems to be playing with, and that the U.S. economy seems to be participating in. Um, let, do, do like a 101, like for people that don't know that Georgia is the epicenter of this uh, EV and electric economy revolution. What's happening in Georgia and why does it matter? So you can sort of like the big sort of high highlights in terms of what we've gotten over the past few years is Rivian, which is the producer of electric trucks and SUVs and also commercial vans for companies like Amazon. They had a big high profile IPO last year. The stock's been very weak since, but they're sort of like the bougie Tesla competitor, I would say. And they decided to put their second plant, their big expansion in uh, Eastern, sort of East Atlanta. And that's gonna be built over the next few years. And that was probably the first big win that got a lot of attention for, for us. Also Hyundai is deciding to put an EV plant outside of Savannah. And then we've won at least four or five different battery plants, solar plants, all multi-billion multi dollars. And so sort of by the numbers, I would say Georgia might be number one in terms of who's won the most uh, sort of plant investments over the past few years. And I think there are a few reasons for this. There's sort of an interesting confluence of, we have the world's busiest airport in Hartsville-Jackson. The Port of Savannah has gotten a lot of investment over the past decade or so. Hmm. And that's sort of increased capacity there. You've always had the story of port to rail to Atlanta to distribution hubs as a story. And so plugging in EV plants is really useful for that. And then we also just have like the the typical Southern things of cheap land, cheap labor, low taxes, uh, you know, incentives from the state. And you put all, and then also we've got politicians both at the U.S. Senate level and the gubernatorial level who have really fought for these projects. Both uh, Senators Opsos and Warnock and Governor Kemp have all really wanted this to be a win for the state and also for their own political careers. And that's kind of an interesting political potentially tension down the road in terms of who deserves credit for all of these. What would it look like if Georgia served as an economic model for other states? What kind of economy would we get if other states looked at Georgia, got super jealous and said, we want exactly what's happening there? Right. So you really need some sort of physical infrastructure to start. You can't just put all this in Wyoming. You really do need some combination of airport, rail, ports, highway, land. So you kind of need like three or four of these ingredients to start. Kind of in the same way that maybe 10 years ago, if you wanted to have a tech you know, office, you needed lots of college grads, a walkable downtown. There was a certain mix of amenities you needed to have to win these, these jobs. It's, it's the same thing here. But again, assuming you're a state that has these things, then it's sort of, it, it is somewhat plug and play of, okay, we need, you know, thousands of acres of land to do this. And it needs to be near the highway, maybe an hour from the airport. So executives can fly in from Korea or wherever. Um, you need workers and housing. So the housing stories become a big focus of the governor to make sure that these companies that are investing billions of dollars to bring plants here can get workers. And you know, it's sort of once you get these plants and you sort of see what you need, you can kind of get the flywheel turning. Yeah. One story that I become really interested in is sort of, I think of it as maybe like a next chapter after my Abundance Agenda article of last year, is that you, I think like, okay, we want abundance of, you know, EVs. We want abundance of whatever, solar panels and wind turbines and maybe, you know, drills for geothermal. Okay, that's cool. But all those things are outcomes. All those things right. are outcomes. What's the input? And how do you create abundance of those inputs, right? Abundance of like the kind of like raw materials you might need, whether it's like, you know, copper or lithium to make the clean energy economy possible. Have you done any thinking on what it would take either at the state level or the federal level for us to get a little bit smarter about that particular policy. And I would just maybe to, to, to stimulate you a bit, like I'm very interested, for, for example, in the Biden administration's approach to oil and the strategic, the strategic petroleum reserve, right? When oil prices skyrocketed last summer, they said, you know what? Finding, making it a domestic priority to moderate the price of oil seems really, really important, not only to the general country and the economy, but also, let's be honest, to the fate of this administration and the Democratic majority in the Senate. So we're going to have a really purposeful strategy to release um, oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, from the SPR, and also to try to find some way to moderate the price going forward by guaranteeing oil producers that we're going to buy their stuff, even in the event of a crash in the oil price. You don't need thinking about like, 
how that sort, how that kind of general like material philosophy might be used to help us guarantee abundance of other necessary materials in the clean energy economy. Well, I think to your point, there's no reason why that oil structure wouldn't work for a whole variety of sort of mission critical commodities for this green economy. So copper, for instance, is has futures traded on the public markets, just like oil does. It also has big booms and busts and price mm -hmm. swings. And so there's no reason why we couldn't have, in the same way we have a strategic petroleum reserve, a strategic copper, copper reserve, where we say, you know, you talk to producers and see what their sort of lowest prices where they're still somewhat profitable and they'll still produce and say, we will buy your copper if it gets below this price, at least a certain amount. And that way you give them some price protection on the downside, encourage them to invest in these mines that are often billions of dollars and take years to, to, uh, to build out. And, you know, we're basically trying to moderate the price of these key commodities so that producers are incentivized to produce, they're still gonna make money, but they're not gonna necessarily, you know, curtail production at the bottom and go bankrupt, which leaves us with uh, deficits going forward. We got some great questions. Uh, one is from James Barlow. This is for you, Connor. He says the EV transition, the uh, electronic vehicle transition, is anticipated to produce job gains at manufacturing centers for batteries, vehicles, et cetera. But there will be job losses in ICE dependent sectors, engines, supply chains, mechanics, gas stations, AutoZone, uh, Valvoline. If you were advising Congress and the White House, what would you be telling them about this trade off? And this is where I think the total number of available jobs is important. And it's not just for, you know, if you're an auto mechanic, well, there are probably a whole lot of other jobs you can have that maybe it's not quite being a mechanic, but it's something similar. So construction, saying tooling, um, manufacturing, it's sort of, I mean, I'm not a, an expert in this, you know, I'm not a hiring manager, so I can't speak to it in particular, but you really want to make sure there's just a lot of jobs so that if one particular part of the industrial sector is shrinking, there's somewhere else that can pick you up. And I, and I think that's what the past year of the economy as a whole has shown. Because again, like last March, Amazon through attrition let 100,000 workers go because they found themselves overstaffed. And yet that never made headlines. You didn't see that in the job numbers because there were so many jobs that people could then go into something else, something similar. And you know, there's, it sort of reduces the frictions that we had coming out of the Great Recession. And it's really just sort of, again, keeping the total number of job levels high to facilitate these transitions. Um, we have a question from Brendan O'Hare about the future of the labor force, which I think is a smart one. With the COVID-induced tech bubble over, what do you think um, the sector's equilibrium looks like in a few years? Are we going to see large market indices dominated by Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, or will they have less influence? So let me break that question into two. I think one question there is about um, the future of the labor force. Are there certain parts of the uh, labor force you think are going to drive hiring in the next few years? And then also on the stock side, for a while, the FANG companies were like 23% of the S&P 500. As they fade a little bit, or as they have faded, do you think other kinds of companies are going to drive stock appreciation? Yeah, I think that, you know, I don't want to say it's going to be a lost decade for knowledge workers, because that's way too doomeristic. But, you know, if, if sort of real wages for tech workers are kind of flat at 2018 or 2019 levels for many, many years, that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. You know, you, you have people who are doing very, very well coming into the pandemic, and maybe they're the ones who see their way to stagnate while manufacturing workers get raises, while Walmart workers get raises, government workers, and maybe the gains of the economy shift to people who had been left behind for a long time. And so they catch up while college grads are still doing very well, but just kind of lagging behind a little bit in terms of on, on a percentage basis. So I think that's sort of what we've seen over the past 12 or 18 months, and I would expect that to continue for the foreseeable future. And I, I think it's, you know, not, college workers raced ahead so much of working class workers for so long that if we have a five-year period of this, or I mean, who knows, we'll, we'll see, but people sh should be able to, to manage just fine. And in terms of the stock market, yeah, I think we are seeing a rebalancing. We've seen energy companies kind of rise and, and tech companies come off to some extent. Maybe industrial companies can gain some market share as infrastructure and, and the green economy get built. And it just becomes a more balanced stock market than we've had for a while. Yeah, it makes me think I am kind of interested in the phenomenon of the downwardly mobile college educated American that for so many decades, we are used to college education being a really, really clear proxy for income gains generation over generation. And just generally speaking, if you're looking at like a particular demographic of Americans um, and you say college educated versus not college educated, that's a really good proxy for, you know, higher and lower income. That's going to be true for a long period. But one thing that economists have definitely started to point out is that that 
excuse me, that college premium has started to decline for all sorts of reasons. It might be because a lot of people that are getting a college education are getting a bad college education at some of these colleges that like, frankly, shouldn't have been accredited. Um, another part of it could be this tech phenomenon that you're talking about, that you're seeing essentially wage gains for college grads generally flatline after a period of extraordinary growth and wage gains for other Americans, maybe in manufacturing, construction, other places start to be demanded at higher rates as you get a tighter labor market. Um, have you been thinking about like what the political implications of this could be? This again, this this flipping of a dynamic that we're that we're sort of used to, you know, a stagnation for college grads and wage growth for non-college grads. Well, I think you're seeing this maybe most clearly in New York and California because I think it's sort of where housing costs were the highest relative to entry level wages for college grads. That's probably where the tension has built the most. And if you get to a point where maybe housing costs don't really go down, but they maybe even keep going up. But to the extent that maybe like a BuzzFeed reporter or just media in general for a while was sort of like the the lagging college grad, if that gets sort of mm -hmm. broadens out to more workers, you have more people who feel put upon who are like who can't keep up in Brooklyn or or the Bay Area or Los Angeles. And do they either push for, push for more political change to make cities more effective, get more bang for their buck on, on money? Or do they just say, I can't afford to stay here. I'm going to Texas. I'm going to Nashville. I'm going somewhere cheaper. And that's part of this migration story of, well, if my wages can't keep up. I need to move somewhere cheaper. And maybe before that's always been a working class story, but that becomes even more of a college grad story. Um, we got some questions about, um, you know, abundance agenda and deep abundance um, for guaranteeing that we have material abundance to do what we want to do with clean energy and decarbonization. And Eric Mankin says, a lot of this sounds like industrial policy on steroids. How do you explain the 180 degree turn on this? What are the big concerns? Um, another way to ask this is, you know, to what extent is industrial policy um, a pejorative to you, Connor? I think it's not clear yet because we're relatively early in it. In, in a way, like if we're going to use like the tech 20 year boom as an analogy, a crude, very crude analogy, it's like maybe we're at the point of like the mid or late 2000s where Google and Apple are doing very well and Facebook is coming on the scene. And you'd say, what do you see wrong with this tech boom? And I'd say, I don't know, status messages are fine and search is good. and I like iPods and this phone thing they're working on sounds cool, but it really only takes until you're much, much further along in the, the boom to sort of see the excesses or problems. And maybe it could be that at some point we get to a point where we're building out solar capacity, but like you sort of look at China where they built out excess capacity for things they don't need or infrastructure broke down because they did too much as so they had some poor projects and corruption. And I think we were starved of, of industrial policy for so long that there's probably a lot of low hanging fruit. You've got the best people working on it for now. But to the extent that there are problems, they won't be apparent until much, much later on down the road. And it's hard to see them this early. I think you said the key word there, which is China. I think to a certain mm. extent, Americans were very happy having an industrial policy. It was just that we outsourced our industrial policy to China. We had an open right. relationship with a company, with a country that had an explicit industrial policy to help us manufacture certain things that we wanted to import at a lower cost. Um, and we thought that it was a win-win. And it turned out that there were concentrated disadvantages that um, were produced by this system that, for example, may have led to the election of, say, Donald Trump, right, um, in terms of the manufacturing recession that we had um, in the uh, in the Great Lakes area, which was probably partially responsible for Hillary Clinton losing a lot of votes in, in that part of the country. So I think you have the next administration, if the Democrats coming in with Joe Biden, who has never been afraid of, you know, the middle class manufacturing um, the, the, the power of labor, saying, you know, maybe we need to rethink our relationship um, to, to um, not only just natural resources, but also to China. I think that's part of it. And then I also think that something about the Ukraine war um, had a couple different effects. On the one hand, it forced the US and Europe to be incredibly purposeful about managing abundance of liquid natural gas and energy to make sure that, you know, um, Germany and whatever, Poland didn't freeze over the winter. And also, I think, it created a lot of fear that if Putin successfully invaded Ukraine, it would send a green light to autocrats all over the world to invade their neighbors and violate boundaries. And one of the ways that we were extending uh, that, that um, uh, idea was saying, what if China invades Taiwan? Well, if China invades Taiwan, what's going to happen is, and let's say they occupy Taiwan and help to constrict trade out of Taiwan and the Taiwanese Strait, it would lead to a global economic disaster. You know, a lot of semiconductor chips, especially the most advanced ones, are built in Taiwan. I think that motivated a lot of policymakers to say, wait, it's kind of crazy that we Americans invented the semiconductor. We invented the computer chip 
And now the technological edge lives in a country that exists outside in the shadow of our geopolitical nemesis. Like, how do we let that happen? Um, and so we started to get rethinking on, okay, should we have industrial policy around energy? Should we have industrial policy around ships? A few, um, as you said, resource critical, or what do you, what'd you call them? Yeah, mission, mission critical. M mission uh, critical resources, yeah. Right. And I, I think that, that, that is a, that's a part of the driver. And um, I think that you know, my outlook on this has always sort of bizarrely combined sort of a libertarian approach to tearing down um, regulations that are unhelpful and it's kind of extremely like anti-libertarian approach to having explicit government policy to make it easier for us to produce things that are mission critical. And so that, that's that's one of the ways that I defend my sort of awakening to the benefits of industrial policy. But um, we can move on in just a second to other stuff. If there's anything on top of that. You yeah, want to I think just you could you could imagine 10 years from now when we've built out all the solar capacity we need, all the battery capacity. And right now you and I are so focused on how can we get more of this stuff. And then maybe in like 2032, the Democratic administration gives this gigantic boondoggle solar plant to Nevada to secure the vote of some Pearson cinema of that era. And then it just sits fallow when it's this gigantic political boondoggle. And mm -hmm. that's probably the kind of thing you could imagine down the road, but we're a long way away from that. Yeah. And and it's um, you know, one of the debates that we're gonna have in the event, in the inevitable event of these boondoggles, because if the government has a certain portfolio for investing in stuff like every other investment portfolio in the history of the world, some stuff is going to succeed and some stuff is going to be a huge failure. And, you know, um, Ezra Klein has made this point before, so I'm totally stealing from him. But he says, you know, when we think about um, the 2009 Stimulus and Recovery Act after the Great Recession, uh, and we think about the failures of, let's say, Obama industrial policy, we think of Solyndra, but we don't often mention Tesla. And both right. Solyndra, which is a famous failure, and Tesla, which is definitely not a famous failure, are explicit outcomes of certain um, subsidies in that act. And sort of interesting, you can learn a lot about what people think about industrial policy based on whether they emphasize Tesla or Solyndra versus um, seeing them in, in an equal way. We had a question about um, uh, star power in film and TV that I wanna ask you about. This is from um, Errol Laurie. Um, uh, do you think that the loss of star power in film and TV is tied at all to the rise of paparazzi and personal life coverage? Since more access is had to celebrities in their personal life via blogs and magazines, people don't have as much of a desire to see them on the big screen anymore. Um, this is probably one of the last questions that we're going uh, to have, but I would broaden it to say this. Um, why do you think stars don't drive audiences as much as they used to in, let's be honest, you know, we're both geriatric millennials in our childhood? right? Like in the 1990s, it was like, oh, Will Smith is in this movie about aliens. Like I've never heard of Independence Day, except as a holiday. I'll still see it. Oh, Will Smith is in this movie about, again, people in suits fighting aliens, except it's called Men in Black. Sure, I'll see it. And like Will Smith plus aliens was like all I needed. Like I'm in, I'm in the movie theaters. <laughs> right Now it's like you need a colon, right? Like we're, we're in the age of the colon, Avatar, colon, um, The Way of Water, or Top Gun, colon, Maverick, um, Guardians of the Galaxy, colon, whatever. Um, why do you think stars has eroded or star power has eroded in the last 20 years? I think it might be, I mean, it's probably hard to, for people under 30 to relate to in the 90s, especially like you might not have a cable for a while, maybe you didn't get the internet as a teenager, just how bored you could be if you were 15 years old. Like you're home on center, summer break, you watch like Sports Center for the fourth time, because, you know, and you kind of know all the punchlines. That was the fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you would wait for Sports Illustrated to come in the, mag in, in the mail or whatever magazine was your favorite. And so there just wasn't much access to media. And so a star in that very limited, constrained ecosystem was a big deal. Whereas now, you know, I could go on, turn on like the back catalog at Netflix or listen to the rewatchables on The Ringer for, you know, literally days and, mm -hmm. and never catch up. And there are just so many options that you need something really, really fantastic to get your attention. And I think to some extent, media, like the fact that we've both seen Top Gun Maverick makes it more special because we can we can talk about it. And unless you have people who have all consumed the same media and have that shared experience, it's just not as special. And so it's hard to create that magic in a bottle when people have so many choices and we've all watched different things, but not the same things. Yeah, I think it's a phenomenon that reaches across domains. You see it in science as well. There's a paper by James Evans at the University of Chicago about how in domains where there are a lot of papers to read, 
the way that people solve that problem of abundance is just gravitating toward reading the same finite number of papers and writing and re-referencing and re-referencing them. And so I think of it sometimes as like the, um, uh, the comfort food effect. But like at the end of like a really, really like stressful day, where you're just like really overwhelmed by a bunch of shit, excuse me, stuff. You, um, you say, okay, I just want like, you know, I want fried chicken. I want potatoes, you know, simple steak. Let's just keep it as simple as possible. Um, and to a certain extent, I think that that is a, a rational, a kind of like evolutionarily rational response to overwhelm, to say, I'm just going to gravitate to familiarity. And so it's possible that in marketplaces of abundance, we are seeing across domains, people, whether they're scientists or consumers uh, of TV and film, are gravitating to familiarity. And then therefore, it takes a lot to push against that tendency. It takes a lot to sort of rebuild or retrain or regalvanize a taste for the original. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying we shouldn't try. I think it's, I think it's awesome. Like I love original um, film and TV, but I think it's, I think it's just very hard. Any well, last thoughts there before we say goodbye? Yeah. Yeah. I think like you take something like Tiger King, would you have watched Tiger King unless everybody else was talking about Tiger King? If it's just I, one other I still wish trash. I hadn't watched Tiger King. Yeah. I, I certainly would not have watched it unless I was told, like, felt instructed by the entire timeline to consume it. So you kind of do need that viral moment. And maybe stars were like virality in the 90s. And Will mm. Smith was just a permanent viral thing. And they just don't have that kind of same virality today just because other, other things do. Yeah, I really appreciate mm. that. I, I think it's a really, really good point. Um, Connor Sen from Bloomberg Opinion, thank you so much. Thank you all. Very, very, very much for um, being here with us. Um, that's all the time we have today. We are going to do another Office Hours on February 6th. We're going to be talking about generative AI, ChatGPT, Dolly 2, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion with Atlantic Deputy Editor Ross Anderson. Uh, you can read more from me at theatlantic.com and in our new print issue. If you enjoyed this conversation, if you want more from The Atlantic, you can support our journalism, of course, by becoming a subscriber. Uh, so again, thank you to our underwriter, Lexis, for supporting Atlantic journalism today. Thank you again so much for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.